Hi, my name is Raj Mehta, and I'm going to be going over hepatitis C in primary care. The references for most of my video talk comes from hcvguidelines.com and also from Hepatitis C for Primary Care Physicians by JABFM, the Journal of American Board and Family Medicine. Most of the images I've used uh, have come from a Google search. Before I begin my talk, I just want to briefly review that uh, some of the things I'll chat about, there'll be different levels of evidence. The letter grade, as you can see here, represents how good the evidence is. Level A is usually randomized control trial. Level B is more limited studies, maybe observational studies. And level C is usually more things like expert opinion. The class, which is represented by numbers here, represents the treatment effect size. The higher the class, the higher the size of the effect and the greater the benefit when compared to the risk. Hepatitis C is quickly becoming the most common chronic viral illness in the United States. As you can see here, in the mid-2000, it overtook HIV. However, revolutionary new treatment options that have just come out in the last couple of years should change this, and hepatitis C, hopefully in the future, will no longer be considered a chronic viral illness, but something that we can now cure and be removed from what we consider as something that people have to live their lives with. Hepatitis C is spread by numerous different ways, usually blood to blood. The most common is injected drug use, but sexual contact usually again through exposed skin and blood. Transfusion before screening, and this is usually in the late 80s before 92. Um, other kind of work, healthcare workers and so on. The majority of hepatitis C is type 1 genotype, as you can see here, but the other genotypes can also be found. Now when patients get hepatitis C, there are two different serological patterns to look at. One is an acute infection. When you have an acute infection, the HCV virus, which is an RNA virus, peaks in your serum, and then the virus eventually comes down. During this period of time, your liver enzyme, denoted by ALT here, tends to go up, and you'll have symptoms. In a majority of cases, actually, with hepatitis C, you don't have symptoms. That's why people chronically have the illness without knowing it, and eventually your liver enzymes come down. Then your anti-HCV are your antibodies that your body makes against the HIV RNA, and after several months, um, they usually get very, very high in titer levels. And again, this is acute HCV, and in this patient, HCV has resolved. They've had hepatitis C, their body fought it, and they no longer have hepatitis C. It's resolved. In chronic hepatitis C, here's a chronic infection, what happens is, is that you get the infection, and you may or may not have symptoms, and your body makes antibodies to it, as you can see here. So this nice little curve shows your antibodies going up. But the virus persists. It doesn't go away. You still have the virus staying. Notice in this picture, the virus stops here. It's gone. You've cleared it. Here, the virus stays. And because the virus stays, you see your liver enzymes represented by ALT. They continue to go up and down. There's continuing inflammation going on in the liver. And this is what separates chronic hepatitis C infection from acute. And this chronic inflammation in the liver is what makes this disease so deadly. Now, uh, to catch hepatitis C, it's recommended we do screening. And so the USPTFS recommends, first of all, that everyone born between 1945 and 65 should just have a one-time screen done. Um, and then there are risk-based attempts to identify screening, and there are different things that can make you high risk for getting hepatitis C. For example, if you have a history of IV drug use, or if you've had a blood transfusion, especially before 92, et cetera, or exposures, if you've had se sexual partners with hepatitis C, or infants born to mothers with hepatitis C, et cetera. The problem with risk-based screening is that it still can miss up to two-thirds of patients with hepatitis C infection. So uh, screening is recommended, um, and it's a very challenging thing to try and catch those people that have it. What makes this even more challenging is that a lot of times people who get hepatitis C, again, don't have symptoms when they're first infected. Again, from guidelines, here are the recommendations for one-time testing, uh, USPTFS class 1 level B, everyone from 45 to 65 should have it, and those with high risk uh, exposures or behaviors in the past should have it done. And then some people uh, are recommended to have annual testing, and those are people who have persisting uh, injection drug use, um, and also actually uh, men who have sex with men. And it's thought that these people are at risk for re-exposure, so even if they test negative, uh, you can do repeat testing for these people. 
Another thing to consider is that now that we can cure hepatitis C, a patient with previous hepatitis C who's been cured but has high-risk behaviors, again, should be retested in the future because they could always get the infection again. So how do we test for hepatitis C? Well, it's actually pretty straightforward. We begin, begin by doing an HCV antibody test. We check to see if your body has antibodies HCV. If there's no antibodies, then that means you don't have hepatitis C. There's no way. You've never developed any antibodies to it. You don't know, need to do any further testing. Now, let's say somebody does test positive for hepatitis C antibodies. Well, we don't have to panic because it's possible that this person might have gotten hepatitis C in the past but cleared it. Uh, it just means that they've had the infection in the past. So if you get a positive hepatitis C, the next thing we have to do is we have to look for hepatitis C RNA. So this is a two-step process. The first step, you look for HCV antibody. And if that's positive, the second step you need is you need HCV RNA. Okay, you cannot diagnose chronic hepatitis C without first checking your HCV RNA. So it's a two-step process. Now, if you check your HCV RNA and it's negative, that means that person had hepatitis C acutely in the past, but they cleared it. They do not currently have hepatitis C infection. So you can tell that person you've probably had hepatitis C in the past, but you've cleared it. Um, the other alternative is that this can also mean that you might have had a false positive. Now, on the other hand, if you have a positive hepatitis CV antibody and you have a positive HCV RNA, that means you have an ongoing HCV infection. And especially if it's been going on for more than a couple of months, that usually means the patient probably has chronic hepatitis C. This chart here below again outlines everything I just mentioned. Again, and just to go over guidelines, as I mentioned, if you have a positive HCV test, you need to do a RNA test to confirm. If you do confirm it's positive, you want to see that that's still persisting for six months because if, if it's there for less than six months, it could just be an acute infection. If it's more than six months, that suggests chronic hepatitis C. Once you confirm someone has hepatitis C, uh, you usually want to do a genotype to find out what kind of hepatitis C they have because that can direct treatment and therapy. And this last point again just comes back to the fact that if you're HPV positive, but your RNA levels are negative, again, RNA level is negative, that means you can safely tell that person that you probably have had an hepatitis C infection in the past and that you do not have active infection, that you've cleared that virus. Now, once someone has been uh, diagnosed with chronic hepatitis C, so you've diagnosed them, there are some general recommendations. First, uh, it's recommended that you have to counsel that person, the fact that they have it, they can get liver disease, and they shouldn't spread it to other people. You're going to tell them to abstain from alcohol, no drinking. You're going to test them for signs of hepatitis C, B and HIV because concurrent infections with this can make uh, their disease process much worse. If they haven't been vaccinated against Hep A and Hep B, and presuming they don't have those infections, you should vaccinate them. Uh, and again, you want to tell them how they can avoid transmitting that HCV disease to someone else. Now let's talk about treatment of hepatitis C, chronic hepatitis. This is really exciting. There's been novel breakthroughs that's just totally revolutionized the way we think of hepatitis C. And this is going to transform us thinking about hepatitis C as a chronic illness, because in the past we didn't have a cure, to something that's now curable. And this breakthrough happened in this period right here in 2013, 2014. In the past, we had some nonspecific drugs that we could use to try and control and reduce the progression of hepatitis C, usually antivirals and things like that. But then around 2013-2014, FDA approved uh, sofosbuvir and then semiprevir and then these other novel agents that are coming out. And these drugs, um, again, can actually cure hepatitis C. And we'll look at that. For those of you in it, interested, this image kind of describes the different mechanism of where those drugs work and how they block it. So here, this is a great table that shows these new novel drugs around here. And you can see how over here we're getting remarkable cure rates. Uh, and now you can even get 100% cure rates of genotypes 1 and 90 plus cure rates of uh, genotypes 2, 3, and 4. Just fantastic. Uh, the brand names of these, Solvati, which is really known, Harvani, which combines Sofosibir and Ledispavir, and then now Vicura Pack, and I hope I'm pronouncing those correctly, the newest one. Uh, and again, these are all wonderful options to cure hep C. These are from the guidelines for treatment of hep C. And as you can see here, these new guidelines are much better than the old guidelines. There's no more antivirals. Now it's curing, 12 weeks of treatment, and all of these 
first line treatment, they all include sulfosavir for the most part, or one of the other new novel medications that come out that can just uh, uh, treat this disease completely. This is great news. One thing I do want to mention is that these new novel medications, they are very, very expensive. Uh, a treatment with uh, Solvati, for example, can cost upwards of $80,000, up to $1,000 per pill. And so these are very new drugs. Uh, they're very expensive drugs, and there's a lot of written in the media and some controversy about their expenses and so on. So it is something to be aware about. Hopefully, as newer drugs come out from different companies, these costs can be reduced in the future. Okay, so let's summarize and review this. So hepatitis C can be diagnosed by having an HCV antibody test and also then checking for RNA levels. And if they're both positive, that's how you diagnose it. Once you've diagnosed someone with hepatitis C, there's some basic things you want to do. You want to check their liver levels, and you want to check if they have hepatitis A or B, and if not, you want to vaccinate them. You want to check your genotype. Basic health stuff, you want to check your glucose levels and GFR, CBC. Look for thyroid and HIV, because if you have other comorbid diseases, your illness can get much worse. You need to counsel their patient about their disease, how to avoid transmitting it, avoid alcohol, et cetera. Vaccinate them if you can. Then um, once you've got this, you want to get them to hopefully a hepatologist or yourself uh, to try and get them on these new novel medications and cure this because it's now a curable process. Thank you so much for listening.